is Go Beyond, the teaching and preaching ministry with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, please come and visit us. Let's now join in with the Judah Ministries praise team at the Worship Center. So this morning, I want to speak to you about the power of thanksgiving. Look at your neighbor, say that there's power in thanksgiving. There is power in thanksgiving. If you would open your Bibles, we'll get there in a couple of minutes, but to the book of James, chapter 3, you could almost 
also thumb mark Philippians chapter 4 and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So it's James chapter 3, Philippians chapter 4, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we'll get to those scriptures in a minute. But speaking of our national celebration of Thanksgiving, I just want to go over a brief history of the inception of it, how it evolved into what we celebrate today. It was in the early 1600s when the separatists and the Puritans made their ways to the shores of America. They were seeking simply the freedom to worship. They didn't come here for any other purpose, but simply for the freedom of worship. They wanted to break apart from the Church of England because in that time, the Church of England and the state were one and the same. You know, the church and state were, were one and the same. And at that time, Bibles were then becoming available. So people started reading, because, you know, people didn't always have Bibles. How many of you know that? People didn't always have the written word of God. You know, we, I, we take this for granted. We got, you know, 15 of them in our houses. We got one on our phone. We've got every translation, you know, at the, in a split second. But, you know, that wasn't always the case. That was not always the case. So Bibles were becoming available, and the people, the common people, were beginning to discover God's truths for themselves, not what somebody just stood behind a pulpit and told them. Somebody say amen, please. Don't, please, just don't take my word for this, all right? You got to go study the Bible for yourself. You will not stand in front of Christ at the day of judgment. Well, Pastor Mike never told me that. Mm. You got to do a little digging for yourself. So they were discovering God's truths for themselves, and they wanted to worship however, whenever, wherever, and with whomever they wanted to. They didn't believe that the state government, the federal government, if you will, should oversee and run the church. So that's what they were breaking the Puritans and the, the separatists. That's what they were breaking away from. Uh, and in the midst of this, however, many of them, in this transition, moving from Great Britain into what is now the United States of America, in this transition, many of them lost their lives during the birth of this great nation. Mm. We sit here today because a whole lot of people made a sacrifice. Come on, somebody, help me here. A whole lot of people sacrificed their very lives, their children's lives. They lost husbands and wives and entire families so that we could sit here today and worship freely for the past couple hundred years. Come on, somebody needs to thank God right there. But even in the middle of all this tragedy that they went through, losing loved ones, all the despair that they were suffering, they had a harvest festival just to set apart a day to recognize our Father and, listen, his son, Jesus Christ. Please don't ever leave Jesus Christ out of our history, somebody. Because that's what the world tries to do nowadays. We're talking about Jesus Christ here this morning. But they began to set a day aside in, uh, in the fall to recognize Father, his son, Jesus Christ, for the provision. And in the middle of their immense struggle, hmm, they took time to worship. They took time to pray. They took time to give thanks to God Almighty. So once again this morning, I'm talking to you about the power of thanksgiving. Around 150 years later, we break free from England and we become a nation in 1776. 
Then a short time after that, civil war breaks out in our nation in 1861. Uh, if I could have my slide up, please. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, makes a national proclamation which partially reads, I'll read this to you, it's up on the screen. It says, Now therefore I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, do hereby appoint and set apart the last Thursday, which was changed to the fourth Thursday, in November next as a day which I desire to be observed by all, hmm, all my fellow citizens, wherever they may be, as a day of thanksgiving and praise to Almighty God, the beneficent creator and ruler of the universe. Is somebody with me? So let's remember when he makes this proclamation, church, because right now it's in the middle of the Civil War. It's in the middle of immense tragedy. It's in the middle of brother fighting against brother. It's in the middle of losing more Americans in a war than any other war even to current day history. The President of the United States sets aside a day to recognize huh, that our God is our Father. He is God. Hmm? He is the creator of the universe. And whatever we are going through, He deserves our thanksgiving and praise. Come on, somebody give Him a praise right there. Then if you read the entire proclamation, he even goes on to say that he wants to encourage every, hmm, every fellow citizen to humble themselves and pray with supplication. I'm talking about the President of the United States. He may have just well read 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 when the Bible says, if my people, come on somebody, if my people will humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear their prayer, I will heal their land. Come on somebody, help me this morning. You see, church, we've turned away so far. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ this morning. I'm not talking about those outside these walls. If my people will humble themselves and pray. No, we just want to sit around and pontificate about who's in the White House. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and preach this morning. The question is not who's in the White House, who's in your house? We need to pray like never before, church. I don't care who occupies Pennsylvania Avenue. I don't care if it's a Democrat. I don't care if it's a Republican. I don't care if they belong to the Tea Party or the Birthday Party. Listen, we need to be praying for that person in there. If my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, it's high time that the church begins to call sin, sin, and stop hiding behind this pluralistic nonsense that is just an alternative lifestyle. My God. My God. So he encourages every fellow citizen to humble themselves and pray with supplication for harmony and unity to return throughout the land that God himself gave us. And we know as history teaches us that one year later in 1865 the Confederate Army surrendered and we became one nation under God. Now could you imagine huh, in the 21st century how many lawsuits would be filed today if a president 
uh, try to make a national proclamation to set aside a national day to recognize our God, namely Jesus Christ, with prayer, worship, fasting, and celebration. Could you imagine? Hmm. In our current pluralistic society, the courts would be overrun with lawsuits, separation of church and state. Listen to this loud and clear. Loud and clear. Because that really gets misconstrued if you watch the media about the separation of church and state. That is nowhere in our Constitution. Somebody please help me out and say amen. Here's what the Constitution says. The state has no place in the house of God. But the house of God has every place in the state. You need to keep the government out of church. But honey, you better not keep the church out of government. Because once that happens, you turn around and people with... Oh God. People begin to do what they think is right in their own eyes. They stop removing in God we trust off of coins. They start turning all the things in the Bible where they say that a living child within a woman is no longer a living child, but it's just a, uh, uh, it's a piece of flesh in there, but it's not a living life. Hear me what I'm telling you. When you read the Bible, abortion is first degree murder. Make no mistake about that. It's premeditated. The Bible is clear to say when God speaks of the prophet, he says, I formed you in your mother's womb and I knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. And then we could read in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark, it says when Ma uh, Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist and little Mary just happened to come walking in her house just finding out that she had just conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that John the Baptist inside of Elizabeth began to leap for joy. Come on somebody, I'm preaching this morning don't ever get confused that abortion is a political issue it is not it's a biblical issue come on somebody praise God but this falls at the seat or at the feet of the church my my but could you imagine if a president or even a governor tried to put a day aside to worship Jesus Christ, courts would be overrun. But listen, church, the lesson in all of this for us who to believe, who believe, is there is power in thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father. Stir up our spirits. Stir up the soil in our hearts, O oh God, that your word might come forth and bring forth fruit out of our lives, Father God. Open our spiritual ears, Father God, that we might hear what you're teaching this day. We'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the matchless holy name of Jesus Christ. All of Judah said amen. 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 So this morning, while we're in this season of Thanksgiving, we're talking about the power of Thanksgiving. I'm speaking of Thanksgiving, listen to me, as a verb and not as a noun. Well, let me break that down for somebody since I didn't get an amen from anybody. There is no power in eating turkey and stuffing. Hmm. There is no power in eating cranberry sauce and yams. Now somebody needs to hear this. This is going to be good revelation for somebody here. There's no power in eating that third slice of sweet potato pie. Come on, somebody. Just trying to help you now. Just trying to help you. So we're talking about Thanksgiving as a verb, not as a noun. 
First of all, how many of you know that Thanksgiving isn't just a day or a season for the true believer in Jesus Christ? Hmm? We shouldn't be just giving thanks on the fourth Thursday in November. If we are, then we have a long way to go, somebody. We should be giving thanks every day. Every day. Thanksgiving is a lifestyle. Thanksgiving is an attitude, meaning to be grateful, meaning you're appreciative. These are attitudes, and they are not contingent huh, of what you have. They're not contingent of what your circumstances are. Thanksgiving, somebody, is a choice you make. Trials, tribulations, challenges in life, they're inevitable. Somebody say inevitable. inevitable. But misery is a choice. Huh. You choose to be miserable. You can choose to be miserable or you can choose to be thankful. You have to be one or the other. You can't be miserable and have Thanksgiving at the same time. You can't do both. They can't coexist. Come on, somebody. Worship and worry can't coexist. Thanksgiving and murmuring, come on, I'm trying to help somebody here, can't coexist. So let's read James chapter 3. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. So let's read James chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It reads, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Now watch this. If anyone is never at fault in what he says is a perfect man, how many of you know it's a lot easier to not have fault in what you do than in what you say? Mm hmm. Able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses uh, to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So, James is using the analogy of our tongue being an instrument of navigation. Are you with me? He's talking about our tongue being an instrument of direction, a steering mechanism of your life, if you will. In, in other words, you could turn an animal with this bridle. You could turn a ship with a rudder. You could turn your life with that thing between your teeth. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to help you here. You can set things on a proper course. He's stating that we put bits into the horse's mouth wherever the master wants him to go. Consider the ship. Just a very small rudder directs this huge seagoing vessel. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning that we have a huge life ahead of us. And it's directed by this tiny little rubber right between our cheeks, located between, it's called your tongue. Even when our lives, listen, are driven by strong storms, when the winds kick up, when the waves kick up, James is trying to communicate to us that we can use our tongue, we can use our words, we can use our confession to navigate us through the storms of life. Now, the Scripture is saying that our tongue has the power in it to direct our lives in which direction we wish to travel. Now, you all know, we quote this verse often, the power of life and death is where? In the, it's in the tongue. Do you speak life or do you speak death? It's real easy to speak death. It's real easy to be negative when all hell's breaking loose in your life. 
But we need to learn to control that little rudder in our life. The, the, the tongue has the power in it to direct our lives. How many of you know that we can learn, listen, we can learn to be thankful in the midst of the storm? Right? Sometimes you have to learn these things. It doesn't come natural. We have to learn. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience. How many of you know we can learn to be obedient and being thankful and praiseworthy even when things aren't going right? Come on, somebody say amen with me. You know, a couple of weeks ago, after a very, very long day, I got home. It was about 10.30 at night, maybe 10.45 p.m. I was just settling down, sitting in my lazy boy. How many of you with me right there, you know? You got that special place. <laughs> You know, and, and it's like when you hit it, just like, you know, everything just kind of like, whoosh, you just kind of, there's another zone. Any, anybody familiar with that zone in this house? Well, I'm just sitting down. All of a sudden, my phone rings at 11.15 p.m., and it's my eldest son, Josiah, calling, calling me. Well, kids never call for anything. They text everything. How many of you know that to be true? They, they speak with their thumbs for real. You know, so when I see a phone call, I know it must be something of importance that he wants to speak with his father. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I like, you know, yeah. But he wanted to tell me that he had a flat tire. <laughs> so, not a problem. We have trip away. Just call trip away. Well, I don't have my wallet with me. <laughs> I left it at home. And if you know anything about AAA, you have to have your card with you on site or they ain't coming. So daddy, <laughs> sitting in his lazy boy, one eye already down, the other shortly behind it, has to get up, grab a wallet, run up to the middle school where his car was, had to run it up to him. Not only that, it was late at night, it was cold, it was raining, I'm tired, I had to run back out, and hear me when I tell you, pastor was a fussin'. <laughs> and nobody heard me, how many of you know you could fuss and nobody hear you, right? Man, but this thing was going on with inside me. Hussin and a fussin. Mm. So, jump in my car on my way to the school. In the middle of all my fussin, thank God I wasn't cussin. <laughs> Jesus redeemed my tongue, thank God. The Holy Spirit, as he often does, spoke in a very gentle voice to me and asked me this simple question. Michael, hmm? do you know how many parents are rushing to hospitals right now because their children are in dire life and death situations? Uh. Bingo. Hmm? Let me tell you, church, it was a real checkup from the neck up if you know what I'm talking about. I mean, in an instant, in an instant, there was an attitude adjustment. How many of you know the Holy Spirit can adjust your attitude if you allow him real quick? Come on, somebody. And so I get to the car. <laughs> oh, this just gets funnier. I said, okay, call Trip away. He calls Trip away, tells him his number. Tells him, broke down. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, you've already used your three calls. We can't come back. You know, because you only get three calls with AAA. For those of you who don't tri use AAA, I mean, we're like, you know, prime members with them people. We're on first name basis with most of them, right? <laughs> so they said, well, we see another. He goes, Josiah's first name is Michael. They said, well, we see another Michael Yerisha on there. Maybe, is he with you? Well, that's me. How about him? No can do. I've used all mine. 
So mine are all used up. His are all used up. And uh, we're stuck. So now we have a teachable moment. How to teach somebody to change a tire in a cold, rainy night. Oh, it gets better yet. It gets better. Oh, we ain't done yet, honey. We dig the jack out, you know. I don't know that Geico commercial. You ever see that? He's calling the dad, you know. Is this a lug wrench? You ever see that? And, and he asked his friend, hey, is this a lug wrench? Oh, well, maybe, you know. It's like, so church, that's where we are in this thing, right? So Josiah, get out the lug wrench, get out the spare. We loosen the tire, get the car jacked up. Tire won't come off the car. <laughs> it's golden on the car. So got to drive back home, get the sledgehammer, drive back to the car. Bingo. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> that's Josiah. We put that thing Bang, one shot, and it came right off, you know. So, thank God. So, we, we, we get the tire off, and, you know, all in the cold rain, finally get home about 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, in my first trip out to help him, as I said, I was not happy. I was fussing all by myself. As I said, church, I didn't even open my mouth to anybody. As a matter of fact, I was so mad. I think when I left the house, I don't even think I told Dora where I was going. <laughs> I just <laughs> slammed the door, you know what I mean? But listen, listen. Here, here, here's the, the point of the story. Just after one word from the Holy Spirit, my entire attitude changed. My entire perspective changed. Change and then believe it or not, I gladly drove and we changed the tire and got the, the car home. Come on, somebody praise God. So, our attitude, right, our tongues, we're talking about the power of thanksgiving, thanking God that I didn't, I wasn't driving to a hospital, driving to change a tire. No big deal. So many times, you know, that old saying, we make. You know, mountains out of molehills. So we must learn, church, to hear that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn to filter our thoughts through the Holy Spirit before we open our mouth and speak. Well, I want to help somebody right there. Do you wish to travel down a road of peace? Then use your tongue to speak peace. In other words, when you're walking around the house, you see some dirty socks laying in the hallway. Can you please pick up these dirty socks? Or you can say, baby, can you pick up these dirty socks? I spoke the same message. I communicated the same thought. However, one way, it was communicated in peace. The other way, I was communicating it in warfare. Come on, somebody. Are you wondering why you have some warfare in your home sometimes? Oh, a couple of amens there. I know you've all heard this. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. So the question is, do you incite hostility with your tongue? Or do you promote peace? Don't be the proverbial bull in the china shop. Listen to me. I'm talking about your tongue. It's very costly breaking good china. Unfortunately, in the church today, we break a lot of good china just because of the things we say or, more importantly, the way they are said. Just because you want to tell somebody what you think, huh, you can really cost yourself, listen, a lot of relationship because of a flippant mouth. Sometimes your opinion, listen to me somebody, isn't really all that important. Sometimes it's better to be thought to be a fool than to open your mouth and to remove all doubt. Hmm? 
Do you wish to have a life of joy? How? When somebody else receives a blessing, you can speak in two responses. whoop de doo <laughs> You know? <laughs> I'm, I'm really happy for you. Whatever. <laughs> so I'm trying to help somebody to church this morning. Right? That's fantastic. I'm real, yeah, great. That's nice. <laughs> or, listen, church, you can really rejoice with them. You can be excited for God's blessing in their life. The Bible says to rejoice with others. Don't be a favor hater. How many of you know there's a lot of favor haters in the church today? Where's mine? Where's mine? Why are they always getting blessed? Where's mine? You've been waiting and waiting for that new car, and then your relative comes driving up in your driveway with a brand shiny new car. How come I didn't get that new car? Especially when they're heathen relatives. Come on, I'm trying to help somebody here today. I'm trying to live righteous, and I'm driving this old bucket of a car that won't get me across the street, but yet my cousin's living like the heathen Jezebel herself, and here she's driving up in a brand new Cadillac. What's wrong with this picture, Lord? Mm. Rejoice with those who rejoice. When somebody else gets the job that you wanted in your job place, you've been there for 10 years, they walk in there six months, and they get promoted. What's your attitude? Hmm? Rejoice with those who rejoice. I've taught our boys from the time they were able to understand. If you want joy, it's J O Y. Jesus first, others second. Put yourself last. Don't be your own all consuming thoughts. Philippians 2 and 4 says to be interested in others, not just your own purposes. Listen, saints of God, we're talking about Thanksgiving this morning. We're talking about sowing and reaping, really. Your spoken words are about sowing and reaping. Every time you open your mouth and speak, seeds are flying out of your mouth, and you will, we will reap the harvest. The Word of God says that God is not mocked. Whatever we sow, we will reap. Come on, somebody. If you sow contention, you're going to get turmoil. If you sow divisiveness, you will reap chaos. If you sow anger, you're going to reap rage. If you're always tearing other people down, you will never grow. Come on, somebody hear that this morning. Do you desire victory? Come on, somebody. Do you desire victory? Then learn to speak about past victories, even in the middle of your battle. Come on. Do I got a witness in this house? Has anybody in here ever been victorious at some point in your Christian walk? Anybody? You've been victorious somewhere along the line. Has anybody in this house been delivered? Has every, anybody been saved? Come on, somebody. Has anybody ever been healed from something? Has God ever provided for anybody in this house when you were flat broke and God showed up and showed out? You didn't know where your next meal was coming from. Come on, Judah, what's my two favorite words? But God showed up and provided for you. Bye-bye. You see, in the Old Testament, the Israelites used to build monuments of stone as a remembrance where God had met them, where God delivered them, where God provided for them, where God healed them. They would build tab little uh, uh, monuments out of stone as a remembrance. So when they would travel past that place, they would remember that the hand of God was on their life. We need to remember no matter what we're going through, the hand of God, if you're born, come on, somebody. If you're born again, if you're spirit-filled, if you've been blood-washed, the hand of Almighty God is holding you right there, and there's no devil in hell that'll take you from there. We need to remember from where 
God brought us from. We need to call into remembrance the great things that God has done for us. And if he hasn't done anything else but save you, that's enough. Back in the early 1990s, you know, the Lord, I don't know, for some reason, always, like, uses, you know, there's storms of perfection and storms of correction, right? He uses vehicles in my life a whole lot for these things. Back in the early 1990s, early 1990s, I was living in upstate New York, and I was traveling a lot from Pittsburgh back to Rochester, New York, and and I always used to travel, usually on a Sunday night, when there's no traffic. I, didn't, I don't mind driving at night. There was nobody on the road, so I would just take my journey up there. Well, one night, I'm on my way up on the New York State Thruway, Route 90, on this side of Buffalo, in my van. Huh, my serpentine belt decides to break. Now, if you know anything about a serpentine belt, when your serpentine belt breaks, you don't go nowhere. You don't move. <laughs> you pull off the side of the road. Well, you got to remember, this is the early 1990s. I didn't have a cell phone, huh? I wasn't calling anybody. I couldn't text anybody. So here it is, 2 o'clock in the morning, stuck in my van. I had a cassette tape. A cassette tape. How many of you all remember cassette tapes? <laughs> had a cassette tape. Zelvin Slaughter, Revive Us, I think was the name. Revive Us Again. And I put, put the cassette tape in. And as I was fussing, <laughs> once again, there was nobody else to hear me. I'm just in a van out in the middle of no man's land. Begin to fuss. Put the tape in. And Brother Elvin starts singing. And God's going to do it again. Just like he did way back then. He's still the same as he's always been. God is God, and God's going to do it again, yeah. God's going to do it again. Then the verse came up. You remember those prophets of Baal? Elijah prayed and the fire fell. And everybody shouted, God is the Lord. For the fire's going to fall like it did before. Then as Alvin Slaughter can only do, hey, 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 God's going to do it again, just like he did way back then. He's still the same as he's always been. God is God. God's going to do it again. God's going to do it again. And that song, I rewind, right? Play it again. Play it again. I'm telling you, church, after a short while, I was having me some church all by myself right in the middle of the van, right in the middle of the night on a New York State thruway. As the praise began to go up, God, by his glory, filled that van right in the middle of nowhere. And he spoke to me. He says, my brother, he goes, I got this thing. Don't worry about it. So, Mike, come on, somebody. My, my. Right in the middle of the van. Listen, church. Praise God that you don't have to wait till Sunday morning to have church. Oh, I'm trying to help somebody right there. You need to thank God you don't have to wait till the Judah Ministries praise team uh, strikes up a song for you to begin your worship. Huh? Huh? Thank God you don't have to wait till Sunday to build our Father a tabernacle of praise. Thank God you don't have to wait till Sunday to uh, enter into his presence or for his presence to enter in your situation. I'm trying to help somebody right here. Listen, we need to be thankful that we serve an on-time God, an in-time God, an overtime God, a God who will never leave us or forsake us no matter where we are. Come on, Judah. Somebody give him 15 seconds of praise in the house. Pastor Michael will be right back with today's message. If you would like to hear or watch other messages by Pastor Michael on your computer or electronic device or learn more about our ministry, please visit our website at www.judaministries.net. 
and click on Go Beyond. Now let's get back to today's message. I'm trying to encourage somebody this morning to be thankful in the midst of whatever you're going through. We sang the song this morning, Psalm 100. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Listen, church, the natural progression into the holy place. You've got to go through the gate of thanksgiving. You've got to go through the court called Judah. Oh, come on, somebody. That's your namesake. You've got to go through the court called praise before you're going to get into the holy of holies. That's where his presence is. But you have to go through thanksgiving. You have to go through praise. If you need our God to intervene on your behalf, just begin to thank him and give him praise. Come on, I taught from this a lot of times. Psalm 22, there's a misnomer in Christianity, right? Come on, Judah, I've taught you this a lot. When praises go up, what's the, world, what's the church say? But that's not correct. It's bigger than that. Psalm 22 says, when praises come up, the blessings don't come down, but the blesser comes down. Come on, somebody. See, too many times we get caught up looking for the hand of God. Hey, baby, I'm looking for his face. I want to be up and close. If we want to know the heartbeat of God, we can't know the heartbeat of God from an arm's length. Oh, come on, somebody, I'm preaching now. Listen, if we want to know the heartbeat of God, we have to have our head right here, right in his bosom. You've got to be up and close if you want to hear the heartbeat of the Father. If we need God to intervene on ourselves, we need to build him a tabernacle of praise. As a matter of fact, that psalm in Psalm 22 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. One translation says God is enthroned on the praises of his people. There's only one time a king takes his throne. He takes his throne to conduct kingly business. So if you need our father, he's not just some pauper king. He's not somebody who was elected. I'm here to tell somebody he's the king of kings. If you need him to move on your behalf, just begin to praise him. He will take his rightful place on your behalf. Come on, somebody praise God in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God's going to do it again. God's going to do it again. He's the same as he's always been. God is God. And God is going to do it again. But as I began to worship him in the middle of the night, I began to recall how he had brought me through things in the past. I began to recall other victories. My whole countenance Changed. My whole attitude changed. Hear me when I tell you, my circumstance did not change. Our Father is much more interested in you than your circumstance. Uh, somebody needs to receive that. But everything changed. I was set free from my miserable why me attitude why me lord even though it was the middle of the night nobody in sight the glory of the lord had filled that van swept over my soul the peace that passes all understanding began to consume me in the midst of my trial Listen, church, it was all a process in what God was preparing me for. I was learning to defeat a lion. I was learning to defeat a bear because I knew there was a Goliath. There was a giant coming my way somewhere down the road in the the future. My father was preparing my hands for war. Listen, saints of God, the battle you're in now is just preparation for a bigger battle down the road. 25 years ago, I'm almost done. 25 years ago, I had no idea that Father would place me as an under-shepherd here at 525 Market Street, 
McKeesport, Pennsylvania. So in some ways, God was preparing me in that night to serve you. I had no idea 25 years ago that God was preparing me to shoot me out to the nations of the world to proclaim Christ crucified and to see thousands and thousands get saved. God was seasoning me. I was in a spiritual crock pot, if you will, a slow cooker. The name of that slow cooker is called humbling. Huh? The name of that crock pot is called broken. The name of that crock pot is called being molded for a greater purpose. Listen to me, somebody. Don't despise God's slow cooker. When the heat gets turned up, lift your hands high and give our God some praise. Amen? Two scriptures, and we're out. I need you to open your Bibles. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. We're talking about the power of thanksgiving, the power of your tongue this morning. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, he says, verse 16, rejoice always. How often? Always. Come on, say it again. How often? Always. always. Pray continually. How often? Always. Continually. Verse 18, give thanks in most circumstances. All circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Often quoted verse. Verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. Always. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer, by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And here it is. Watch. Here's a formula. If, then. If you do those things, then the peace of God, which transcend, transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. So just let me give you a closing thought here for clarification of what we just read. The Bible is very specific to say to give thanks in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. You all with me? It says give thanks in every situation, not for every situation. In other words, when you get a bad report from your doctor, oh, I thank God that I got a bad, no, no, no. You don't thank him that you got a bad report. You don't thank him that your wife is acting up, or your husband's acting out, or your kids are going away. You don't thank him for those things, but in the midst, I'm trying to help you right here. In the midst, while everything is turmoil, there's no devil in hell, listen to me, somebody, that can stop you from raising your hands and doing a Holy Ghost dance right in the midst of the fire. You can look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the kind of faith we need, not this name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. We need even if kind of faith. Even if my wife doesn't come back. Even if my husband's cheating on me all over town. Even if my kids are out, strung out. Even if I lost my job. I will praise you, Father, with all that I am. In the midst of the fire. Come on, you know that story. The Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the fire. He looked in, hey, I could have swore we threw three young boys in there, three lads, but I see a fourth, and he looks like the son of the gods. Come on, somebody, listen to me. 
when you get thrown into that fiery furnace, Jesus isn't going to meet you there. He's there waiting for you. Come on, somebody. The Bible goes on to say they came out of that fiery furnace. Not even a smell of smoke. Huh. Not even a smell of smoke on them. The Bible says they came out. The only thing they were missing <laughs> were the things that kept them bound up. They went in bound. They came out free. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning, your fiery furnace is trying to set you free from something. Thank God in the midst of it. Don't just sit and pout. Sometimes you've got to make a decision. You've got to either pout or praise. You can worship or worry. Make your choice. But I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, if we want God to intervene on our behalf and to transform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, we need to take control of the rudder in our life, the tongue which is between our teeth, and learn how to give God praise, learn how to worship Him in the midnight hour, learn how to thank Him when all hell is breaking loose. We're talking about the power of thanksgiving. We serve a mighty God. We serve a mighty God. So church, Let's stop the mumbling, the grumbling, the groaning, and the griping. And let's be a people who knows how to give thanks and praise to God in all circumstances and in all situations. Come on, Judah, if you're with me this morning, put your hands together and give our God a great big praise in his house. Thank you, Lord. Come on and stand with me, please. To every nation, to every generation, to all creation, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ.